Hello, everyone. Welcome to our last sustainable event, Beyond Addiction, Therapeutic Development and Societal Impact. Um, we're going to start off with an introduction from our provost. So, Sabelle, would you like to start? Sure. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, as Vanderbilt's provost and chief academic officer, it's my pleasure to welcome you all to this lab to table event. Uh, where our panels will explore the complex and important issues of substance use disorders. Before we dive into the panel's discussion of everything from neuroscience to therapeutics, I want to extend a heartfelt thank you to each one of you for being here. And thanks to our Vanderbilt graduate student, Christine Yoon, professors and directors, Aaron Calipari and Craig Lindsley, and our additional esteemed panelists. I also want to thank our Dean of Vanderbilt School of Me Medicine Basic Sciences, John Curian, for supporting this fantastic conversation. As you know, or perhaps as you are going to learn, in the United States, over 40 million individuals grapple with substance use disorders. And this number surpasses the number of Americans affected by cancer, diabetes, or heart problems. Despite the treatability of these disorders, many members of our communities face obstacles in getting access to the help that they need, facing significant barriers presented by social stigma, the slow pace of drug development and regulation, and a shortage of adequately trained medical professionals in this important area of health care. Tackling pressing societal ch challenges like these uh, lie at the heart of Vanderbilt University's mission. Universities like ours can play a powerhouse role in transforming our understanding and treatment of substance use disorders through path-breaking scientific discovery. It's because of my belief in the power of scientific discovery within universities that I launched Vanderbilt's university-wide initiative, Discovery Vanderbilt, in my first years as provost. And I'm so pleased that this conversation and professors like Drs. Calipari and Lindsley are such key leaders in Discovery Vanderbilt. This university-wide initiative embodies our commitment to pushing the boundaries of knowledge and innovation so that we can provide powerful, feasible solutions to some of society's most pressing challenges. So once again, thank you for being part of this exciting event. And I'd like to pass things over now to our stellar moderator, Christine Yoon, an outstanding pharmacology PhD student in Dr. Calipari's lab. Christine, over to you. Hi, um, I'm Christine Yoon a pharmacology PhD student at Vanderbilt's School of Medicine, Basic Sciences, which is hosting this event today as a part of a monthly series of conversations connecting biomedical research to real life topics. Today, we'll be discussing substance use disorders, current and potential treatments available to people just dealing with substance use disorder and the impact that it has on individuals and communities. So what is the framing for this discussion? As the provost has previously stated, in the US, around 40 million people have some substance use problems affecting more individuals than cancer, diabetes, or heart health concerns. Although substance use disorders are treatable, many people don't receive the help that they need. Why? On the scientific side, there's still so much we don't understand about substance use disorder and how to develop the best therapeutics to combat all the symptoms. On the societal side, there are also is issues such as stigma and limited healthcare infrastructure that are hindering people from getting proper treatment. So what is the neuroscience of addiction and how does it impact individuals, families, and communities? What is the current state of therapeutics for substance use disorder? Today, we are very excited to have experts in preclinical and clinical research on substance use disorders, a drug development expert, and a journalist who reports on poly substance use crisis to discuss these questions. So without further ado, we'll start with the introduce, introductions from each of our panelists. Aaron, Aaron could you start? Yeah, I will. Um, that was wonderful, Christine. Um, mm -hmm. I am Aaron Calipari. I'm the director of the Vanderbilt Center for Addiction Research and associate uh, professor in pharmacology. And my work really studies uh, basic mechanisms of how drugs change our brain and how that causes a lot of the things that are phenotypic characteristics of addiction. Um, and Bill? Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Bill Stoops. I'm a professor in the Department of Behavioral Science at the University of Kentucky uh, College of Medicine. Uh, I am trained as an experimental psychologist, and I do all human research. I do human laboratory research on the behavioral and pharmacological effects of drugs of abuse like cocaine or methamphetamine. I also do clinical trials where we try to translate what we've learned in work like errands with, uh, with, with uh, mice and rats and in human laboratory work like I'm doing out into actual trials for efficacy. 
And then uh, Craig. Hi, uh, Craig Lindsley, professor in pharmacology and the director of the Warren Center for Neuroscience Drug Discovery, which is a small biotech within the university now, a clinical stage biotech. Um, along with other people in our center, Carrie Jones in particular, we're developing fundamentally new ways to treat substance use disorder and meeting a lot of challenges as it comes time to try to translate those to the clinic. So happy to have this conversation with everyone today. And finally, Jen. Hi, I'm Jan Hoffman. I'm a behavioral health and health law reporter at the New York Times. Most recently, I've been writing about addiction. Uh, I really focus on, so on social stigma and on barriers to uh, treatment. Okay, so to start off with a basic first question, what exactly is substance use disorder and how does it differ from casual substance use? Um, Bill, could you start off? Oh, sure. So uh, substance use disorder is a formal diagnosis, um, uh, uh, and, it's, and it relies on um, a diagnostic interview typically delivered, well, typically, should be, how about I say it that way, <laughs> delivered by a trained clinician, so a psychologist or a psychiatrist, physician, um, uh, to determine uh, symptoms and signs that, that, are, that indicate drug use is problematic in someone's life, right? So there's 11 criteria. And uh, if people endorse more than two or more, then they are considered to meet substance use disorder criteria. And it goes from mild to moderate to severe based on the number of criteria. So, so it's a formal diagnosis. Uh, you know, it's a formal process sort of. Um, and the sort of key feature, there's again, there's 11 symptoms, but the key feature is that it has become a problem in a person's life. Um, so neglecting important activities, as an example, in, 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 in an effort to obtain drugs. So that it, it is different than sort of casual drug use in that way, that it is problematic, right? Um, uh, so, um, yeah, I, I'll stop there. <laughs> I, I think one of the things to maybe highlight that I think is a really important thing of substance use disorder and addiction um, is that it's it's not one thing, right? So Bill said, there's 11 different symptoms. You don't have to have all of them. You can have different categorizations of these symptoms, which means that it becomes really complex because lots of people could be suffering, but different people could be experiencing it different ways. And so I think one of the big things for research and the kinds of things that, that Bill and I are doing is, is do we need to treat people suffering from substance use disorder in different ways differently. And so it's a really um, interesting thing. I did also just see something in the chat, which we said that we wanted to, to touch on. And it says, is it strictly drug use or does it include alcohol? And so one of the really important things is that when we think about substance use disorder and addiction, oftentimes people's thought goes to opioids and methamphetamine and cocaine, but nicotine and alcohol are also drugs of abuse. And so you also can be addicted to those. And so when we're talking today, we're not just talking about the opioid epidemic or stimulant use. We're also talking a lot of times about alcohol use and smoking, which alcohol and smoking are some of our biggest um, issues in this country, in the world. Um, just adding on to that, you just use the term substance use disorder and addiction. So are those words synonymous and um, also, Jan, if you could also talk about how these terms are being used um, and perceived out in the public as well. I'll I'll let the scientists answer the distinction <laughs> so, so, first, and so, then I'll, I'll weigh in. Yeah, unless Bill feels differently, but yeah, you they're used usually interchangeably. We've kind of shifted our language in talking about people suffering because there was a huge stigma around addiction, right? We referred to people as addicts and junkies, which is really inappropriate and minimizes the disorder as a brain disease. And so now what we really focus on is using language that is more appropriate. So substance use disorder is the disorder and it's individual suffering from substance use disorder mm -hmm. rather than stigmatizing the individual. And so thank you, Christine, for asking that because I think it's a really important thing to think about how we talk about individuals so that they feel empowered to try to treat this brain disease. And I think the only thing I would add is, yes, I think they're often used synonymously. Yeah. Addiction does not per se have a formal diagnosis. So if you're thinking about working within a treatment organization, um, folks on the call may or may not know that, you know, being able to bill for a diagnosis drives a lot of our healthcare decisions. And so um, 
you can't really diagnose somebody with addiction. What you di what, what they are diagnosed with is a substance use disorder. And it can be, Aaron is right, alcohol use disorder or tobacco use disorder or all of the above, because we also know that polydrug use is the norm. Um, uh, but but so in terms of sort of formal um, uh, uh, treatment settings, we, we really think about use, use disorders. Um, when I'm writing my grants and my papers, I'm thinking about use disorders because that's how we will uh, identify our participants, right, to meet inclusion criteria. Um, but I, I think we can all recognize that, that 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 addiction encompasses substance use disorder. I agree with Aaron about how we how we use language is really important. Um, and I also think Aaron's right. Like substance use disorder as a diagnosis is problematic, right? It's eleven criteria you can meet any number of them to you know. Sometimes it's craving. Sometimes you know it's 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 any number of things. So it's very um, heterogeneous and and uh, but but f unfortunately, it's sort of the it, it, it's it's what we're stuck with to a degree. So I will try to keep my response somewhat short because I have so much to say on the issue of language and stigma. Um, I, I will. The first thing I want to say is I, I noticed I believe, unfortunately, Aaron, it was you sort of inadvertently and in passing may have used the term drug abuse. Um, that a, a lot of people think that in and of itself is a problematic term. We talk about child abuse, you know, we talk, that's usually a word that you use in the criminal context. So that's why more and more people who think deeply about these things are using the word use rather than abuse. It's it's less judgmental and it's less associated with, with criminal language. Um, you know, uh, Bill is absolutely and a thousand and ten percent right that language really helps to frame and reframe our notions about health policy and what things look like on the ground. So, for example, um, I'm actually writing a piece right now about the growing adoption of the word poison or poisoning to talk about the relationship between particularly fentanyl and someone who succumbs to it. But when you think about it, if you unpack it on some level, you know, medically speaking, you all can speak to this much more clearly than I, poison is exactly right. It's a substance that harms you. It's, 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 it's a straight definition. It's value free. But when you talk about someone who died from fentanyl po poisoning, as opposed to fentanyl overdose, you are creating very different images in the listener. And when you speak about someone who has been poisoned, you are, according to many prosecutors and even politicians, implying there is a poisoner. And that in itself becomes problematic. So language really matters a lot when we're talking about substance use disorders. Yeah, and it's a, it's a really good point too with opioids, thinking about them in that context, because they also, and this is like Craig can speak to this, we actually need pain management in the clinic. So you have this really big problem, right? Where when you say all opioids are bad, people who are dealing with chronic pain then are afraid of using them, even though maybe they do need to use them for treatment. And so I think that's a really big struggle too. And I, I know the Warren Center is really trying to, to focus on both how do we have people take less drug, but also are there ways to find non-opioid analgesics and pain management and things like that? I know Carrie Jones has been working in that space too. So just to follow in on that, I think the, the use of language, I think is so interesting, especially when we consider that most of the substance use disorder research funding we get is from NIDA, the National Institute on Drug Abuse. So even the language there from the federal government yeah. is, is maybe needs to needs to soften or change yeah. a little bit. Um, you know, I can say, you know, preclinically, you know, one of the things we really struggle with is when you identify novel targets that, that could um, treat different symptom domains of substance use disorder. So whether it's self-administration, drug seeking, reinstatement, all these things you can model preclinically. Um, beyond the fact that those rodent models are really expensive and time consuming, for a lot of therapeutic areas, you can do a, a very acute, pharmacodynamic model in a rodent, you can do it in, in one day or two days. Um, anything with substance use disorder, you first have to train the rodents to self-administer and then maintain those animals. And it's just, it's a lengthy, long and expensive process, even just to 
get your uh, preliminary pharmacodynamic data to support your target. But then as you start to transition these things toward the clinic, what you find is a lot of companies are hesitant to do clinical trials in SUD, despite the fact that the preclinical data is very robust. So what a lot of us have been doing now, a lot of people working in the field, is you start looking at mechanisms that can be very effective in other brain health disorders like schizophrenia, depression, but mechanistically, they'll also address different symptom domains of SUD. And so when you go into a clinical trial on schizophrenia, where again, substance use disorder is comorbid, um, you can look for a reduction in drug seeking and self-administration there while you're also looking for your primary endpoint in behavioral symptoms. And that may just be the only way we can go about it. The same thing for depression and others, and we have to find mechanisms that overlap with more, more desirable uh, clinical development projects. Yeah, and this is kind of really where Bill comes in. I, I think that one of the reasons he's here is because he's a dynamic speaker and, and really inspiring, but also because he's really bridging the gap. You know, what Craig is talking about is like, we do these preclinical studies and companies are afraid to go in on them because they don't know what's going to happen and how it's going to be regulated. But Bill is actually doing these translational and these test studies in human patients in his labs. Um, and so like, I guess, Bill, do you, I know you guys have a lot of things that work, but then there are still barriers, even when you have things that are really effective to trying to get them to the next phase. Yeah. So, so I think the first thing to, to Craig's first point about the names. So they were going to change. Congress almost got there, <laughs> but, but about two years ago, I believe it was in the budget bill and right as it was passing, somehow those, those, those name changes for NIDA and IAAA and SAMHSA did not actually pass. So the federal government recognizes the need to change the names. It's just we got to get the federal government to act, right? So that so I just that's that may be a fact that people don't know. Um, we almost got there. Um, as far as sort of medication development, I think to Craig's point, a lot of what we've done when we're doing so so you know I think maybe I can explain just very quickly the work that I do. The University of Kentucky is one of the few places in the country where I can safely and ethically do research on 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 drugs like cocaine and methamphetamine in human beings. There's a lot more that goes into it than me just saying it. So if you've got <laughs> questions, reach out to me afterwards. Um, but we're doing it so we can do drug combination studies to look at potential pharmacotherapies, to know that they're safe, to get an inclination that they're efficacious. This is all work that needs to be done before we actually advance things out into what we all think of as sort of your traditional clinical treatment trials. So that's what Aaron's talking about is we're in the gap, but we we are still stuck with, we really can only test comp medications that are either readily available. So repurposing things. And that's a huge thing that the field is doing. If you think about all the stuff with Ozempic, right? People are looking at GLP-1 drugs for substance use disorder, right? Um, we have looked at... Um, you know, a, a, any number of medications um, uh, and sort of to repurpose them as a treatment for substance use disorder, because that's what's there and that's what's available. It's much harder to work with an experimental compound for a lot of regulatory reasons and safety reasons with, you know, for uh, all 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 good. Um, uh, but but, you know, we're, we're sort of stuck a little bit there. Um, but, I, you know, I'm thinking about the drugs that we do have available that have been approved. Most of those were were moved along specifically as addiction treatments. If you think about the history, right, methadone and buprenorphine, varenicline, um, uh, you know, bupropion is a bit of a different case in that that they saw an effect in patients with depression and reduced smoking. But but for most of them, they were developed in a sort of rational pipeline way. Um, simple that's oversimplification. But so I, I think that's evidence that we need to continue trying to do this, but perhaps in a more concerted effort. And it, I agree that it, getting drug companies interested in advancing pharmacotherapies for substance use disorders is hard for any number of reasons that we can talk about today. But I've noticed an increased interest. Um, as the opioid crisis has really, really hit us full force. And it's not just opioids anymore, which is a change for the 20 years that I've been doing this work. Thank you so much. Um, so kind of relating off of that, what are some big scientific questions that are being trying to be trying to be answered right now? And um, Aaron and Bill, if you guys have any um, that's things a, to say about this. Yeah. That's, I think that's a, a hard thing. So I think one thing my lab has started focusing on that maybe is a little different than everyone else to some extent. So when an individual uses drugs for a, a, a repeated a period of time and you look in their brain and you do imaging, there, there are changes that happen because of that drug use. 
And I think a lot of the field focuses on the drug use itself. So, okay, people are taking drugs. How can we make them take less drug, which I think is obviously one, one facet of what we should be doing. But I think one of the other things that is really important is what those changes in the brain mean to an individual, even outside of the drug context. And so if you have a disorder, it doesn't just affect things around drugs. It also affects how you experience other pleasurable things in your life. Maybe how you value a negative consequence associated with drug use. And so a lot of what we're focused on is what is changing in the in the brain of an individual who has taken drug for long periods of time to really shift that balance and decision making that extends beyond the drug process. I think if we can start to pinpoint how we normalize that dysfunction and how we make non-drug associated behaviors maybe more adaptive, I think you can start to to kind of target this disorder in more than one way. One, how do we reverse the dysfunction? The other is how do we make people crave drug and seek drug less, right? And another one is how do we reduce the harm with taking drug? Can we just have people take less drug? Can we reduce the risk of overdose? Like all of those things would contribute to increasing the quality of life in, in, in these individuals. And so I think thinking about it in a more complex way is a kind of interesting way to think about maybe new targets we haven't studied before. So Aaron has led into sort of what my sort of pet interest has been recently. Um, and I, I will also know what Aaron did not say is she's doing a lot of really sophisticated work on sex differences in substance use disorder, which is I think it was something we need to acknowledge, right? People are very different. They're different based on sex or different based on a number of other different aspects. But but I have been thinking a lot lately about how we require, how we have defined treatment success as abstinence only, right? That you have to be completely abstinent from this drug for X period of time for us to say you're successful in treatment, right? And then in fact, we kick people out of treatment if they happen to use a drug. Right. So I don't know any other disorder where we stop treatment for people based on the nature of the disorder. Right. It's a chronic relapsing disorder. And, you know, we, when you slip or when you use, we're going to not treat you anymore. So I, th I think I think that's something we need to societally be thinking about. But but to me, the onus is on the scientists to identify what the other outcomes are. So I've been thinking a lot about drug use reduction. Right. And the alcohol field has gotten there. Right. They are actually at a place where they accept uh, no heavy drinking days as an indicator of treatment efficacy, right? So people can still drink alcohol, but they don't drink alcohol uh, to meet the heavy use criteria. We don't have that for their use disorders. I'm seeing a lot of really exciting literature come out around cocaine use. Um, and I'm, I actually stay tuned, just finished a clinical trial that is all about cocaine use reduction and the various cardiac immune psychosocial factors that might go along with that. So benefits of reduced use relative to you know, continued use, but we're right at the beginning of that. I think that that is, I think that's, that's a place where the field is going and I'm really excited about it. Now, again, I have personal interest in this. I think this is, you know, th this is really, really important for us to do. So I'm a little biased, but, but, <laughs> I, but I'm excited to see, there was a paper that just came out not too long ago that, um, you know, the director of NIDA is quoted as saying, this is where we need to go. So I felt a little validated in my interest. And I think that, well, that that's sort of where Aaron was was coming from. Yeah. Too. Well, and Jan, Jan, I know you've been interested in the harm reduction aspect of of things and the human aspect of it. And so I'm interested to hear your thoughts from from kind of really studying the the people and how that affects their lives. Are you you're talking about using less? I mean, cutting back slowly. Yeah. So. Like what like what kinds of things? I know you've really looked at like the impact of drugs on the individual and society. And I guess what kinds of things are used you seeing in your work that that's really kind of shaping the individuals taking drug and what they're they're they look like in society i guess well you, you know can i have the next hour please um yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um it, again out of deference not only to all of you um but frankly because i'm just riveted by what the rest of you were saying i was like i have less to contribute you guys really are i'm writing down all these things for future story ideas um I I think theoretically the idea of cutting back uh volitionally use of, particularly of stimulants and even of, of opioids is a wonderful concept I'm very familiar with that model in the world of alcohol and even of cigarette use um it I'm very eager to see 
how that can be implemented because the drugs have such a powerful undertow effect. And in, in what I've seen, you know, for example, on the streets of Kensington in, in Philadelphia, or I was recently out in, in uh, Western Michigan, um, both among people who lived in tents out in the woods and in people who were in treatment, is that the drugs have such a potent control, uh, as frankly, as Dr. Stoops, and, and, and you also said, Dr. Calipari, that cutting back is really, really hard to the extent that some people have a, a rationale, well, you know, I cut back on the fentanyl, so I'm just using meth. Or uh, I cut back on meth and I'm just using fentanyl to get me through. I mean, that calculus is extraordinarily difficult to achieve. And then there are many people who use drugs who say, I'll use whatever I can get. So again, I, I totally understand the model of, of of cutting back on alcohol, but I think drugs are really difficult given that people have embedded lifestyles around them or basically, I don't even know if lifestyle is the right word, survivor styles is really more accurate. Um, I mean, when when you think about people in the in sort of some of the more extreme uses of, of opioids and some of the people I saw living out in the woods and constantly having to move as the police would you know break them up, or you know, people in in the encampments in Portland, frankly, they would be using opioids to get through the day, to basically, as you all know, stay well, not get sick, and then feel compelled to use meth at night to stay awake to guard their their belongings. So, how do you unpack someone from that extreme cage? I find very difficult and challenging, but worth taking note of to give grace to the people who are caught in this terrible struggle. Well, and you brought up a thing that I think I'm going to ask Craig a question, um, is that people are often using multiple drugs and it may be, not be at the same time, but like when we're developing targets, Craig, do you, do you think that there's going to be a target that we can use for all drugs? Or do you think it's going to be something where basically each drug, we're going to have to really target the systems they're engaging and they're going to be different for something like THC or marijuana versus alcohol versus stimulants. Like, I guess, how are you guys approaching those kinds of issues? Yeah. So if you look mechanistically with the, the kind of the targets folks have been pursuing for a while, some seem really specific for nicotine, kind of like, you know, the Chantix and some yeah. of the ion channels. Um, some of the GPCR targets actually seem to be broadly applicable. They they seem to work against alcohol, cocaine, opiates, uh, drugs they've been tested, methamphetamine, drugs they've been tested against. So I think it, it really depends on the circuits you're modulating, you know, uh, and, and, and that. So I think it's possible. You know, one thing, just to follow up on the earlier question, I think is so important um, is cannabis use disorder. You know, I think there's all these reports coming out now where 30% of adolescents are developing psychosis and bipolar disorder after after the cannabis because what they're able to buy now is 90, 90 to 95% THC, where the, the marijuana of the 70s was 3%. And as we legalize it and it's not regulated, you know, adolescents are going to keep thinking, well, it's legal, it's fine, it's safe. It's it, you know, and then it's gonna be a it's gonna be a much bigger deal than alcohol use disorder because of the psychosis and, and all the other symptoms that they're gonna start uh, developing. So, and that's it. And you know, the psychosis they develop as well isn't treated by current typical atypical antipsychotics. So that's something we need to get ahead of right now. You know, we need to start developing the preclinical models and hypotheses to understand what's the origin of psychosis from cannabis use disorder and try to get ahead of it. Um, but, you know, even if you do that now, you're still looking 10 years out. And by then, all the states will have legalized, most will have legalized marijuana. The problem is going to be very prevalent especially if it's 30% of adolescent users develop these symptoms. So I think a big part of what we need to be doing in parallel is education and awareness so that people are just aware of this high potency THC. And again, how that's a gateway for other drugs, right? Alcohol and THC become the gateway to having to go to cocaine, heroin, fentanyl to get the same level of high. Um, and so we just need to try to put some kind of brakes on these gateway drugs and, and get some regulation there. Kind of going off of that, um... 
So if we talk about, we talked a lot about treating substance use disorder, but if we can look at a different angle, what are some ways that we can prevent the onset of substance use in the first place? I, you know, Craig sure. said this, and I, I think it's a really good point is I, I think education, like, like fact-based education is really one way, you know, you're not going to stop it. This has been something that's been with our human society since really like the beginning of time. And so I don't think it's something that's going to go away, but I do think a lot of times, you know, this got brought up in the Q and A at the beginning. Oh, what about alcohol? Like we talk about substance use disorder and drug use and people immediately think these other drugs, but Craig brought this up. There are lots of drugs that we have that cause addiction as well that are legal. And so when you have legality and you don't have these conversations, people assume they're safe and, and not just people, but you're talking about adolescence. In adolescence, you still have the developing brain, right? Your brain is developing and it's not fully developed. And so if you are taking drugs and what drugs are doing in the brain is they're hijacking the receptors that are there normally, they're activating them in ways they normally wouldn't be during those times in development. Are you changing the way those brains are being wired? And so I think a lot of it is basically getting out into the community and educating people in a way that is, you know, informative and, and so that people know. And so I think that is a big thing, which is why we do conversations uh, like this. I don't know uh, other forms of prevention. I don't know, like Craig and Bill, if there's things that you guys know about that are really focused at preventing use. I know people have targeted some preventing the transition to dependence for opioids with like treatment in, in, in clinics, but I don't know as much about prevention based yeah, so I, I I will I will begin by saying I am not a prevention researcher. So, I, but I, but I do know some. Uh, but, you know, I think I think for I, many of us, we all went through the Dare program if we were in public school. <laughs> um, uh, data suggests that that sort of original Dare is not an effective prevention program. So I think we need to recognize that we have made strides in programs, school based prevention programs. The idea is that you should not scare students, right? You really should be presenting facts and truth to them. And so I think that's really important. Another, you know, another, and this is probably old data, but, but I, th I think it remains true is that kids who are occupied with other activities are probably not going to progress to problems with drug use. Now there's a caveat there. If the activities that they are doing, if they're, if their social networks are using a drug, they are then more likely to use drugs. So you have to be careful, right? You think you're protecting them by having them in swim or dancing or whatever it is. And, and that is, probably true but then if their social group happens to be using drugs in that activity it isn't as protective as you would as you would want it to be so so those are a couple of thoughts that, again i i am not on the cutting edge of prevention but that those are some of the things that i've picked up in my, but, in my time and i think maybe jan has has some thoughts that's what i was about to ask jan yeah. because like you jan your whole job is to communicate thoughts and things to the public in ways that they'll actually consume it and have an impact and so you know, are there effective ways? Like what are what are ways to do that in a way that is not preaching to people, but is providing them information in a, in a way that they will consume that information? I was thinking about this as, as you were both speaking. Um, and, and one huge caveat with what I'm about to say is um, how do we avoid panaceas and bromides? You know, when we give, you know, I spent a number of years at the Times writing about adolescent health, uh, behavioral health. I think, and I was also smiling to myself because I remember when I was in high school, some of the biggest drug users were our athletes. I mean, they they love speed and they love to trip. They love tripping. So, um, oh well. Um, I was thinking about. Um, a health director at a clinic in a tribe whom I spoke with recently who was talking about the importance of embedding identity and self-confidence in young people as a way of feeling good about themselves. So now she was talking about the end stage and treating people, but she was talking about returning people to their sense of identity as a way of avoiding having to lose themselves. And I think if we think conceptually about that up front, we begin to get more closely approaching 
what teenagers can be thinking about. Are they going to are they going to be thrill seeking? Of course they are. That's like right there in the front of the brain. Um, and one of the problems, of course, is, you know, even far better than I, that the, the current drug supply is rife with counterfeit pills. And truly the campaign of one pill can kill needs to be, you know, I think really made even much more manifest. But I think that if you emphasize with kids, you know, give them their space to experiment, but also talk about what that can lead to. And also give them a sense of pride, a sense of hope, a sense of the future to aspire to. Because, I mean, again, talk about bromides. Millions of kids are in different states of despair, you know, economically, socially, politically. What does that look like for them? Well, it looks like a hell that you sure would want to escape from. And why not? So I, I think more deeply, we need to have a more powerful mental health and social structure embedded to really meet them where they're at. It not it's not you can't do scared straight. I mean, you have to do embrace the positive. And you know, far be it from me to say what a perfect program looks like, but I was very moved by the the tribal health person talking about returning to people identity that they can truly own and feel special about. Well, yeah, it gets to the mental, the the comorbidity. A lot of these disorders are not just people taking drugs. They're no, sometimes it's, it's, it's to avoid pain. It's to avoid anxiety and depression. And so, you know, how do you, they all look different. So are they different treatments and things like that? Um, Craig, I know you guys work with a lot of, I guess you focus a lot on these uh, like schizophrenia and things like that, but have you guys looked at any treatments for things like depression, anxiety, or how that influences like how some of your drugs are acting um, in the brain? Yeah. So you know, a lot of the mechanisms that treat depression and anxiety also are very effective for uh, various substance use disorder profiles. Same things for antipsychotic, new mechanisms there as well. Uh, you still, you get great efficacy against alcohol, uh, opiate, um, amphetamine, so I think there's a lot of overlap there. And again, as I mentioned before, I think to get companies behind you, that may be a great way to uh, develop a new drug that can be used off-label for substance use disorder because those indications are so comorbid. Schizophrenics, for example, abuse all kinds of drugs because they're trying to quiet the voices because they don't really like the, the atypicals they're on. So I think that's probably the best way to, to get some of the stuff into the into the market the fastest. Oh my God, are you yeah. seeing the questions in chat? I I, mm -hmm. I Keeping an eye on yes. Um, <laughs> yes. Um, so one of the questions that we keep getting is that we keep mentioning alcohol as a substance commonly used. Why is alcohol not more regulated? Or can anyone explain why it is socially accepted when it causes so much harm? Well, we we tried. We did try. I, I will give the, the United States, we gave it a good go and we had prohibition and it didn't work. Um, I think this gets at the at the, the kind of problem with substance use disorder, right, is that some people drink and they take drugs and they never develop a substance use disorder. And so I think you have this conversation where people want to be able to have a glass of wine or a cocktail and they say, I'm totally fine. And that is actually maybe true for people, right? And so they you have society that wants access to this, but then it is also harmful. And so it's really, really hard to regulate. We do regulate it on some level because you can only make drinks that have a certain amount of, you know, alcohol in them and things like that. But it, it's a really challenging thing when you don't know who will develop it. And I think that's, you know, with a lot of disorders, you have a prognosis, you say, oh, you're high risk and, or you have this disorder, you will, you know, this is the outcome at the end. But with substance use disorder, you don't know who is going to overdose? You don't know who is going to develop it. You know some factors that could influence that, but then a lot of people take it and it, and it doesn't happen. So I think it becomes really difficult to do that. Um, well, also think pragmatically too. Just begin to imagine the billions of dollars invested in wineries, in you know, <laughs> the alcoholic you know beverage industry. I mean that just the lobbying energy of that alone is mind-boggling and then plus you've got 
so many different uh, entertainment venues. I'm not talking necessarily even about bars and restaurants and clubs. I'm talking about the media that you consume. How how often do you see in a Netflix film or whatever you see, you know, where alcohol is is the is the the term of communication. Let's go have a drink and talk about it. So it, it's it's so normalized and embedded without much sort of caveats to it. I mean, right. how how many even reality TV shows show people knocking back drink after drink after drink and people joking about it? So th there's just a it, it it's it's in our soul. It is so difficult to sort of remove it in a meaningful way. I mean, when I was talking to the tribal health director, she mentioned the fact that alcohol is not allowed to be sold on the reservation. And I said, wait, was that imposed on you or did you choose it? And she said, we chose it because we wanted to deal with alcoholism. And she said, and bitterly so, our biggest problem, bigger than meth and opioids is alcoholism because people just go over the border, bite there and drive back drunk and there are terrible car accidents and so forth and so on. So, you know, modern day prohibition is not necessarily an answer. Yeah. Well, if you think about it, I mean, I'm, I'm old enough to remember how, how influential the tobacco lobbies were. There was a time when people smoked on airplanes. You know, there's ashtrays in the arms of all the airplanes and everywhere you went, there were billboards with the Marlboro Man and the uh, the, the unfiltered camel cigarettes. I mean, it was just, it was a blitz and every TV show had actors. I mean, everyone smoked and it was the cool thing. And it's only been like the last decade or so that you've really seen even a, 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 a big diminution in that just in popular media. So, but that, but, that, but, but that's an excellent example of how stigma can work in a profound public health way. So, you know, someone who smokes in a restaurant is kicked out. Now people give them dirty looks you know, there, there's been almost like a collective community goodwill because the downstream effect of tobacco has become so widely publicized, cancer, lung cancer. So I do think that if if drinking to however one determines excess becomes more stigmatized, you would get more of a collective sensibility that this is not necessarily something to run with but again that has so much to do with with peer pressure and public pressure and one thing i will add so i mean i think i think you know everybody should know alcohol does cause cancer and, and can cause heart disease and all those kind of things but i think we also need to think about the history here right and so i, I i'm not going to provide a history lesson but 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 if we think about pre-prohibition right or even after prohibition there were strong commercial factors driving alcohol use. And this is this is global, right? I think there was a question there about it. Are we talking about just US? And a lot of the facts we're giving are probably US based, but but you know there's a there's sort of a global commercial drive for alcohol. And there was for nicotine, right? I think it was the Surgeon General's report in the 60s that really started the decline of, of, of tobacco use. Um, but then if you think about cannabis, which was highly sort of racialized in that if you think about the movie Reefer Madness, right, that blames and wrongly so, I want to be very clear you know, people of color for using cannabis and for, you know, engaging in bad behavior. And so, so the idea was that these other drugs, right, were, 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 were not acceptable because A, they didn't have a commercial lobby behind them. And B, they were, they were, you know, they, they, there, there was a racial undertone or overtone, quite frankly, to a lot of it. And so I think that speaks to how we've gotten to where, you know, we've got certain drugs that are legal and acceptable in our society and, and others that are not. So, so it's, you know, pharmacologically, you know, the drugs all sort of activate those dopamine systems in the brain. I'm oversimplifying, but they all sort of ultimately do the same thing, right? It's just, and many, many of the legal drugs cause a lot of harms, but it's, you know, it's sort of the sort of commercial and societal acceptance that that is different across them. I think alcohol is really unique too, and that it's not just people that have, that drink every day. A lot of young people just do binge drinking. So they say, I don't have a problem. I don't have any issues because I don't drink all week, but then, you know, Saturday I'll drink till I pass out. Um, that's still, that, that's kind of a really unique uh, form of, of, of alcohol use disorder. The, the, the kind of the binge approach versus this, the, like everything else is more chronic. 
so I think that's just really kind of an interesting uh, paradigm there with alcohol. Um, thank you so much for this discussion. Um, there was a lot of talk about how regulations are both helping and hurting um, efforts to combat substance use disorder. But um, just kind of to wrap things up in the last 15 minutes, in your fields of expertise, um, what does success look like for treating substance use disorder? And what are some benchmarks that can um, achieve that? So we can start off with Craig, maybe. Um, well, for someone that just spends his whole life trying to make drugs, I, I think the, 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 the fastest way to make an impact is, is education and awareness and try to get people to, to, to not start. That's the surefire way with the drugs of abuse. Obviously, with, with pain, therapeutics, opiates, folks are going to need those in the hospital when they're having procedures. We need to develop something that can be co-administered with the opiates. It'll prevent drug seeking and drug reinstatement when they're out. Um, but I think for everything else we're talking about, I think it's really education of adolescents and explaining the developing brain and the consequences of not becoming the people they were meant to be because of the choices they're making and the strength of the, the drugs that are on the, out there now. So. I would say prevention education is the the, the, the quickest way we can we can uh, have impact. My my field is is unique, and I'm gonna use this opportunity to explain to people that re, re, basic research is really critical. So my lab studies really basic questions. We use like optical tools to record in the brain while animals are making decisions and doing things to try to figure out the neural dynamics that encode information. And I think on some level, you know, you can say, okay, well, like that's not translational, right? I'm not just screening drugs to see, you know, can we find a new target? But I think like this, this group is so great because I think this is a problem. That's such a large problem that you need a fundamental understanding of how the brain works, even outside of the drug context. So that you understand what these medications and what the drugs are doing to the brain and what that means. You need drug targets. So we do a lot of um, molecular biology approaches where we can identify targets. You need people making drugs that can target these targets you think will work, which is where Craig comes in. And then you have, now you have a target, but you need to know if that's something, one, that will work in our model. So we can do that first, but then also, will that be effective in humans? Because Drug use is not just, should I take drug use, drug or not, right? In a lot of our models, where it's like, will we take drug or not? But humans are making these complex decisions. They're taking drug at the expense of something else. When are they doing it? Sometimes you can do two things at once. And so how how is this working into whether these are effective? And so, you know, success for my lab might just be understanding how specific cells in the brain respond to drugs and non-drug stimuli, right? And that might not be really apparent right off the bat, why that's so critical for substance use disorder treatment, but it's a really key component to having us make an under, make better drugs, understand them, understand what we should be targeting. And some of that just takes basic understanding of biology, which is, I think, a really important thing that the academic institutions can do that maybe are not things that are done in, in pharma. I wanted to, yeah, yeah I, you know, uh, Again, sorry, we don't have an hour for me to answer the question. <laughs> um, I think a couple of things are, are really important in terms of how you define success. And I'll just talk about two of them. One is that I think we, whoever we are, in whether you're listening or whether you're participating in, in hard research or whether, like me, you're just the typist, uh, need to do a better job conveying to people at large that this is a chronic relapsing disease that may for many people require lifelong medication because currently there is a very big stigma both internalized and externalized about taking one drug to quell another it People struggle with that idea. They refuse to accept that idea. And I think it's because, again, we haven't done a good enough job selling the biodynamics of addiction. There is so much stigma against people who take drugs to stop taking drugs. You know, all I'll just say 
brief in that regard is I think that's one reason why methadone clinics are so problematic because people have to go there. It's got a lot of problems, but people have to go to that clinic every single day for their medication. They line up outside, you know, there's public displays They're you know, they're stigmatized as being drug users, blah, 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 blah. But the other, another aspect of success in treatment that I think is incredibly important is that addiction be taught through very many levels of medical school from the get-go, that it should be taught, you know, in treating heart disease, in treating obesity, in, in treating pregnancy. And it is not universally accepted at all strata of medical education. It shouldn't just be that someone does a residency or a fellowship in addiction medicine, although thank God there are people who do that. It really should be threaded throughout the embrace of what it means to be a successful and compassionate and wise practitioner at every single level of whatever element of practice you choose. I mean, I mean, you know, those of you who know far more about alcohol use disorder than I know that, for example, and I'm talking about dermatology, people who drink to excess, you can see the sp- you can see the results in their skin. So why wouldn't a student in dermatology learn more about alcohol use disorder and so forth? So again, that's only two of 10 points I'd love to make. Uh, I, and I and I would say it goes beyond medicine, right? I, I'm, a, I'm not a clinical psychologist. I don't treat anybody, but I have a many colleagues who are. They will tend, they uh, substance use disorder treatment is not necessarily taught during psychology training, it's once you get into internship, right? And so, and lots of people only treat one thing, right? They might treat depression, but they don't treat substance use disorder. The only thing I would add to what success looks like, um, and this is more of sort of the voice of the patient thing is, what does success look like to the person who needs help, right? Is it abstinence only, or are we imposing that on them? Is it reduction? Is that what they want? Do they want to get their kids back? Do they, you know, what, what is it that they want and how can we help them get there? That That sort of, for me, why I've been spending all this time thinking about drug use reduction and whether it's valuable, you know, and maybe other health, healthier behaviors and aspects that go along with that, absent of abstinence only. So I'll stop there. I know we're, we're trying to wrap up here. So, um, yeah, so just kind of, we were going to talk about some resources that are accessible, but before we go into that, there are some questions that also kind of relate to this topic. So one of the questions says, is there an effective way to integrate the scientific approach and Alcoholics Anonymous in dealing with the alcohol use disorder? Um, does anyone have any um, comments on that? So, so you know, I mean, I, I think I think AA has its place. I, th- I think there's been research to suggest that it works for some folks. It doesn't work for a lot of folks. Um, I, I will say, again, I sort of struggle with some of the things that are in AA, and I know that people do, uh, right? Again, the abstinence only thing I think can be really, really hard for folks. But I know people for whom it's worked wonderfully. And I know that there's been sort of research platforms built within it. So I, I don't I don't want to completely pan it because the, the AA or the NA has worked for folks. And I think it's just, it's a matter of recognizing, right? If you're a researcher, recognizing how to study it objectively, right? Like to not bring, to, to try not bring a bias one way or the other into it. Um, but if you're a person with a use disorder who's seeking treatment, recognizing that, yeah, the judge may tell you you have to go do it. And so you go do it and you get really turned off and then you're just disappointed or maybe you go do it and it really works for you. So so recognizing that that that, that is not the end all and be all for everyone. Well, do you think some of the reason that they can it is really effective is because it creates a community? I think there's a lot yeah. of evidence in, in even like preclinical models that, you know, when you have a social network that you're less likely to take drug and relapse and you take less drug. Now that doesn't mean that you will definitely not but it definitely changes the probability, right? Is it that, and we know this, if you are removed from the environment you're in where there's drugs and stress and all of these things, people do okay. It's how do you navigate the world once the, you basically maybe go to rehab and you go back in there? Do you have a support network and a community? I do think programs like that or other ways of finding that support and community are actually really effective for people. But the question is, what do those, what do different people need? And is that effective for everybody? And it's, it's definitely does not cure the disorder. So, so, so social, but I think the other thing is access, 
you can be pretty much anywhere and find an AA or NA meeting, right? <laughs> you cannot be pretty much anywhere and get buprenorphine or methadone. You can't right. get a medication for stimulant use disorder, although we've got positive signals with a number of drugs that just haven't advanced for any number of reasons that I don't have time to go into today. But if you really want to know, we'll set up a time and I'll be happy to give you my unvarnished opinion on that. Um, right. So I know we need, we need like a part two, three, four to this conversation. <laughs> um, yeah. So what other um, treatments are available for alcohol use disorder and other substance use disorders currently? Um, Sure. So, so I, I will jump in here. Um, I think, I think, you know, the, the, we have medications for several substance use disorders, not all. So for opioid use disorder, there are varying formulations, but we've got buprenorphine, naltrexone, and methadone. For alcohol use disorder, we've got a campersate, we've got naltrexone as well, and we've got antabuse. For smoking, we've got nicotine replacement uh, therapy, varenicline, or Chantix, and uh, bupropion. Those are sort of our nine that are approved. Um, we have had positive results with uh, agonist treatment comparable to methadone for cocaine use disorder, for methamphetamine use disorder. None of those have advanced to, to approval. Um, the other things I want to say, I've seen questions about psilocybin in the chat. With, that's very, we're in the infancy of understanding whether hallucinogens are effective for substance use disorder. I think it is worthy of investigation, but we need to recognize that we are not there yet. Um, I think uh, somebody also talked about brain stimulation, specifically ultrasound, but overall brain stimulation, TDS, TMS, uh, um, those are also sort of being investigated, but are, have not been advanced to being effective. The last thing I will say is substance use disorder has a strong behavioral component. We know things like cognitive behavioral therapy work. My pet treatment that I think is 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 most effective, particularly for stimulant use disorders, called contingency management, using alternative reinforcers to reduce drug intake. I am so thrilled to see CM being piloted by states like California, right? And we're getting there. We're getting a way to pay for it. And we're getting a, a treatment to come online that people are accepting. And I'm really, really, really excited about where that's, well, where that's going. And, and I'll interject Wait. in the last two minutes. We always worry about how we're going to pay for it. But the economic burden of addiction and substance use disorder on society is very large. And so it's about kind of when you spend that money, upfront payment and for things like contingency management will likely save us a lot of money in the long run. But I think it's a really hard thing for people to see in the budget line right off the bat. Can I, can I just say one more thing as I watch the clock ticking down? Yeah. Um, having spent far too much time um, in the entrails of the opioid litigation, which uh, now has over $50 billion in its back pocket as a result. Um, I would urge anybody on this call to pay really close attention to how your counties and states are gonna be spending that money. Uh, because it's gonna be micromanaged at the very local level. There is no, there is a general principle, but no specific application. So. I've seen prosecutors say, we're gonna take that money and use it to get more cop cars. Um, I've seen, I've seen, I saw a small South Carolina County say, we're gonna take that money and fund, fund it with a faith-based treatment program. I'm just saying the money's there, pay attention to how it's being used and advocate if you are passionate. And then if you have, uh, you, you think might need, need help, SAMHSA.gov, has a treatment locator site that I, you know, just just a public notice. Um, if you if you need a resource right now, that is where I send people who who really you know aren't where, sure where to go. Well, um, this has been a really great discussion, and it looks like we've reached the end of our panel. Uh, thank you so much to everyone for attending today and for all of your questions. We're excited to share this conversation, and it'll be posted on YouTube. And there will be a follow-up email with the link. So thank you all so much to our panelists for their insights today. And please join us in the future for more Labs Table events. Have a great day. Thanks. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you so much. Thank you.